Listener discretion is advised. Lucy referenced this Mm. person a couple times at the top because she was very important and influential. Very important. And also a woman of color and an abolitionist and a suffragette and a brilliant writer and just an amazing human being. So Frances Ellen Watkins and then later uh, Harper was born in Baltimore in 1825. And at that time, Maryland was a slave state. Mm -hmm. Uh, But Frances was born a free child to free parents. Mm -hmm. But both of her parents, and I couldn't actually find their names, and some say that their names have been like lost to history, um, died in 1828, Mm -hmm. uh, which left Frances an orphan. I think she was... So she was around three years old. She was taken in by her maternal aunt and uncle, uh, Henrietta and Reverend William J. Watkins, who gave Francis their surname. Reverend Watkins was a prominent figure in the community. He was a civil rights activist and abolitionist, in addition to serving as a minister at the Sharp Street African Methodist Episcopal Church which I didn't know that Methodist and Episcopal could be together in one thing. I thought I those were different same. things. I never understand anything. Yeah. Maybe it's like a Ever. slash. Like, yeah. what the fuck is the difference? Mm-hmm. True crime comedy. Right. Yeah. I, I, like, Catholicism is like the extreme, and then everything else is just sort of the same. Mm-hmm. Zach, as a Jewish person, uh, he, like, just considers all Christianity Catholicism. Right. He oh, just, no. He, I know. I know. He like, And he, all Jews are Hasidic. Okay. Right. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But I know. It's totally, yeah. So he just, he'll like constantly be like, oh, well, you know, the Catholics. I'm like, that's not, they're not Catholic. The they're Catholics. Baptist. <laughs> like they're very, it's not. Anyway. Bless his heart. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all what you know, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, again, Reverend Watkins, her uncle slash new father figure, also uh, ran a school called the Watkins Academy for Negro Youth, where Frances would be educated until she was 13. And Reverend Watkins was, like, very caring and, like, attentive, but also, like, very strict and had, like, very high standards for mm-hmm. his students and especially for Francis and was, like, a bit of a task master. But obviously, like, it paid off for Francis. Mm-hmm. He just had, like, super, super high academic standards for people right. going through his school. Well, which I'm sure you kind of had to for... It's his daughter and his school. And, right. you know, <laughs> as black folks living in... Like, there was a lot of pressure to... right be the best one could be because Mm -hmm. there was a feeling of like representing an entire community. Mm -hmm. Um, So at this point, as was typical for the time period, Frances uh, left school to find a job. She found work as a nursemaid and a seamstress for a white family that owned a bookstore. And this gave her the opportunity to continue her education like on her own in her free time So she spent basically any spare time that she had in the bookstore reading and writing. It was a very ideal job for her Mm -hmm. as a teen. Yeah. Um, I'll say. I know. Lucy's like, I want to work in a bookstore. I do. If you can't get your job at the funeral home, that would have been. (laughs) Funeral home slash bookstore slash dive bar slash (gasps) thrift store. Okay. Open this. (laughs) Business idea. (laughs) Imagine the loan application. Okay. What category are you registering in as a business? Entertainment. Entertainment. Shop slash funeral home slash bookshop slash dive bar. <laughs> you know. We contain multitudes. You get it, right? You get it. You get it. Yeah. Maybe some, pla- some plant store pop-ups on oh, the Oh, definitely like, plants. I'm going to click entertainment, <laughs> et cetera. Oddities oh, yeah. plus Tit shaped retailers yeah. with a redemption center out back. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Recycling hub. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my God. And oh, my God. I'm going to start burgers. sketching now. <laughs> oh, yeah. And like a burger restaurant or whatever. <laughs> yeah. People get hungry. 
<laughs> at a funeral home. Yeah. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they do. I mean, that's We a- did. We brought snacks to Jessica's funeral. Yes, we did. Sure did. We snuck M&Ms them into her throughout. coffin. We did sneak M&Ms into her coffin. I was snacking during the eulogy. <laughs> Got to. Okay, so. It's what she would have wanted. It is. It is. <laughs> so at just 20 years old, Frances published her first book of poetry titled Forest Leaves. And then in some uh, iterations, it was entitled Autumn Leaves. House of Leaves. House of oh, Leaves. God. Yes. <laughs> Bad. The hardest book to read ever written. I own have it. You I read have, it? I have not attempted it. I own it yet. and I have attempted it and it's nuts. I own it and I've read it and I liked it. Don't fucking ask me what it's about, though. I don't know. It's about a house that looks it's way trip. smaller on the outside. Yeah, okay. It's a fucking trip. Mm-hmm. Okay, so <laughs> this book was thought to be completely lost to history until a single copy was discovered in Baltimore by a scholar named uh, Johanna Ortner in the 2010s. So how so cool So how is many that? copies did she put? Couldn't publish that many copies. Probably, Probably didn't not. publish that many copies, and you know, didn't a lot didn't survive, and then they found this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So then, in 1850, when Frances was 26, she left Baltimore after accepting a job teaching home ec. God damn it! <laughs> at Union Seminary, this like brilliant mm-hmm. poet. An author, yeah. they're like, you, you're a woman. You can yeah. teach. You can do Mac. this. She's like, I'm not married or a mom, but yeah, I guess I can fucking sew some shit. Uh, a school for black students near Columbus, Ohio. And here she was blazing yet another trail as the school's first female teacher. Not long after she made this move, however, her home state of Maryland passed a law or like started enforcing an old law, I think stating that free African Americans were no longer to be permitted to enter the state of Maryland, Mm. and if found, they could be imprisoned and sold into slavery. Oh, God. Like, previously free blacks Mm -hmm. could become enslaved. Was Mm -hmm. that super uncommon? I don't think so. I mean, like, even in, you know, 12 Years a Slave is that the movie is based on true events and there were like hustles and wranglers to literally round up free black Americans or formerly enslaved black Americans to basically sell them back into slavery in other states. So I'm sure stuff like that. I've heard of that in a lot of like, like movies, but I don't know if it's like exaggerated. Oh no, that absolutely happened. There Mm. were absolutely like bounty hunters who would track down and find. Right formerly enslaved people who had escaped and become free that way. Okay. And sometimes they, if they were, you know, particularly ruthless, whatever, sometimes they would like fudge the identities and like literally just kidnap free I was going to say, mm. like uh, uh, not, not in the cases of escaped enslaved people, but in the cases of, Pe- black I think Americans have been assume, free their whole lives. I think it's safe to assume that under the right circumstances, any black Americans, born free or otherwise, were susceptible to that kind of... Yeah. I think that I that definitely happened. That. It's That's not like we had, like, fingerprinting and, like, databases right. of identities. You know, like, I think if if they could get away with it, they fucking mm-hmm. did it. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, but I can't. This is even more kind of like I mean what can be more malicious than that but like this basically at the time and I started to go down this rabbit hole and we can't get into all of it but at the time more and more formerly more and more enslaved blacks in Maryland were being manumitted or set free in quotes by their white enslavers Mm -hmm. because the agriculture needs were changing. And so like the white enslavers didn't need the labor of enslaved people as much. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't want to like pay to like feed them anymore. Right. And so they were setting free again, in quotes, like large swathes of these formerly enslaved people in Maryland. And the government was like, "Eh, we don't want a bunch of, 
free black people running around. We need to get them out of here. And so they passed these laws or started enforcing these old laws on the books that they were like any like new and free black people who come into Maryland or like cross state lines into Maryland. Immigrants. Yeah. Can just be enslaved and Mm -hmm. sent elsewhere, basically. Got it. So it's to terrorize free black people in the state Mm -hmm. to make Mm -hmm. them want to leave the state. Right. So at this time, about 49% of black people in Maryland were free and uh, they're dealing with all these different laws. And so some of these laws included state sponsored schemes to transport uh, free black people, basically ship them off to deport. Yeah. Well, yeah, but deport, except they were born in the U.S. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah ship them off to fucking Liberia, Mm -hmm. which was like... Literally Liberia? Literally Liberia. There was like a tiny colony there that had been redubbed the Republic of Maryland. Oh, my God. And like more than a thousand people were shipped over to Liberia with no money, resources, assets, connections, consent, anything... Oh, my God. That's awful. Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So that's a whole different rabbit hole. Yeah. That, that, There's yeah. a lot of rabbit holes in this There's episode. so yeah. many rabbit holes. Yeah. And then also Maryland uh, put up a thing where formerly enslaved people who had been manumitted were, and again, this is before the Emancipation Proclamation. This is people who were manumitted by their former enslavers, were given a deadline to get the fuck out of Maryland uh, because, quote, unemployed adult free people of color without visible means of support could be re-enslaved at the discretion of local sheriffs. So it's basically if you're a, f- a free black adult and you're mm-hmm. not, you don't have legal employment, mm-hmm. you can, we'll just round you up and sell you back into slavery. Mm-hmm. Or... What's a visible means of support? Employment? Employment. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. So there's still vagrancy laws today. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, so when this horror of a free black person being enslaved, like re-enslaved, happened to a Maryland man in 1853, and then he subsequently died trying to escape his re-enslavement, a switch was flipped for Frances. And soon thereafter, she left her teaching job, teaching home ec, and devoted herself full-time for abolitionist causes and her writing career. So she was like, this is fucked. Mm -hmm. You know, her uncle slash father figure was a staunch abolitionist. So she was like, I need to just focus on this because this is fucking wild what's going on. So she moved in with William and Letitia George Still, who were prominent abolitionists and friends of her uncle. And then William Still would eventually become known as the, quote, father of the Underground Railroad, which I didn't know. I'd actually never even heard of him. Hmm. His name sounded familiar. Hmm. There we go. There you go. So she was supported financially by them. Basically, they recognized her talent for writing and and speaking publicly on these issues. And they were like, Mm -hmm. okay, don't worry about like a nine to five job. Focus on this work and like you can live with us and we'll like pay for your room and board and stuff. Right. So Frances began writing poetry for anti-slavery newspapers. Her second book, Poems on Miscellaneous Subjects. Oh, Uh, I know was published in 1854, and it was so popular that it would be reprinted several times in the coming years. Wow. Around this time, she also joined the American Anti-Slavery Society and became a traveling lecturer, which is, like, still hard today. Yeah. To have that be your life, and she managed to do this as a single woman of color Mm -hmm. in 1854. That's fucking incredible, especially given all that shit Mm -hmm. that was happening. God. So in 1854, she delivered her first anti-slavery speech, which she titled, quote, The Elevation and Education of Our People. It was such a success and her speeches came to be in such high demand that she spent most of her time between 1856 and 1860 
traveling around the eastern and midwestern states as well as Canada and delivering lectures. Throughout, though, Frances faced intense gender and racial discrimination, something that she was extremely open about in her speeches. And I just love this next part. Because it it definitely, like, slaps us northerners in the face for, like, Mm. thinking that we're so superior when it comes to these issues when we're fucking not. Mm -hmm. So on one occasion while delivering a speech in Pennsylvania, she stated... Now, let me tell you about Pennsylvania. (laughs) I have been traveling nearly four years and have been in every New England state, in New York, Canada, Ohio. But of all these places, this is about the meanest of all. Uh Oh. (laughs) Not a fan of Pennsylvania. It was us in Cleveland. She is (laughs) making it clear. (laughs) Uh, in <laughs> That's 18, brave. Yeah, in 1858, so literally before the Civil War, mm-hmm. Francis refused to ride in the quote colored section of a segregated trolley car in Philadelphia. Oh my mm-hmm. god! This was 97 years before Rosa yeah. Parks. Damn. Holy shit! <laughs> I mean, Epic. she is brave. Yeah. yeah. Throughout Not her long, fucking around. No. no. <laughs> Throughout her long lecture tour, Frances never stopped writing. She published about 80 poems in nu- numerous anti-slavery journals. In 1859, she published a s- short story called The Two Offers in the Anglo-African Newspaper, which made her the first black woman to publish a short story in, I don't know about North America, but definitely in the U.S. Between 1868 and 1888, she had three novels she had written serialized in newspapers and in 1892, she published a novel called Lola Leroy, uh, which was one of the first novels by a black woman to be published in the U.S. Who has the time? I How know. she yeah. have all this time? Books of poetry, speaking engagements, constantly on the road, constantly traveling, and like right. also writing novels. Yeah. She's basically and Stacey like, Abrams. Mm-hmm. Upending, you know, racial segregation rules right. all over yeah. the country. Right. So throughout her long and prolific writing career, Frances remained dedicated to the cause of civil rights and served as a mentor to many other black writers and journalists. In 1860, Frances Watkins married a widower named Fenton Harper and began... Fenton. Fenton. That's a cute name. Mm -hmm. Wait, fentanyl. Never mind. Yeah. It's ruined. (laughs) It's like everything else. (laughs) Using his last name. So that's where we get the Harper. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Got it. Uh, the couple had a daughter together whom they named Mary Frances Harper, and Frances also helped raise his three children from a previous marriage. So now she's also a fucking mom and a stepmom. Mm-hmm. God. I know. Because with all that time she has. She's a powerhouse. Right. I love her. Also, like, what is 1860 minus 1825? How old is she at this point? Th- 35. Okay. So all this, and she's our age. Mm-hmm. And to have your first child at 35 back then yeah. could not have been easy. Mm-mm. It's not fucking easy now. Mm-hmm. So uh, sadly, Fenton Harper, her husband, died only four years after they got married. Aww. After the Civil War ended, Frances Watkins Harper, along with her daughter Mary, moved to the South to teach newly freed black people during the Reconstruction era. Good so that also God. takes fucking guts. Mm-hmm. You're like, I'm yeah. going to go into the fray. With my daughter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She went where the need, where she felt the need was strongest. Yeah. I Jesus. mean, and, and this is not to devalue anything that this amazing woman is doing, but it's not like there was really anywhere that's going to be safe from all of safe these issues. Safer than the South. Right. I mean, in I this era. In, in some ways, protected yeah. by law, but. You know, yeah. yeah, she's definitely facing these same deeply horrific, like intersectional mm-hmm. challenges, mm-hmm. kind of wherever she goes. So I, I think that show that speaks to like what you're saying, Kenyon, mm-hmm. even deeper that she's going where like the need is greatest, right? Mm-hmm. So by this point, she's a household name in a lot of circles, especially abolitionist circles. Uh, in the years following the Civil War, she was involved in promoting numerous progressive causes, including. Prohibition, so not every not everyone can be right all the time. Mm-hmm. We'll forgive you, Francis, <laughs> for supporting prohibition, mm-hmm. um, and also women's suffrage. So, at well, one point, also 
I just to back up what Amanda was saying, like the the tension. Mm-hmm. She was uh, like a, a prominent figure, so she was a target, mm-hmm. and she was just following wherever like the the strongest tension was. Yeah, she was a I target. Think the, the she was a woman she, of color. She yeah. was a single mom. Mm-hmm. She's got a f- target on her fucking back. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean it's she's fucking badass. That's wild. So at one point she joined forces with Frances Willard, a women's suffragist and a president of the women Women's Christian Temperance Union. Again, we're I'm sorry, it's you know, you can't it's, it's an unfortunate can't, can't part of her legacy. <laughs> <laughs> can't win them all. <laughs> one source states that quote, activists like Harper and Frances Willard campaign not only for racial and sexual equality, but also for a new understanding of the federal government's responsibility to protect rights, regulate morality and promote social welfare. But she soon became disillusioned, and she felt that Willard uh, only gave priority to white women's concerns and ignored her efforts to promote racial justice, uh, such as, uh, you know, working towards an anti-lynching law Mm -hmm. uh, or the abolition of the convict lease system, which was basically just slavery by another name Mm -hmm. along with prisons in post-Civil War South. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, although she would continue to collaborate with white activists, Frances came to feel that it was extremely important that black people have their own organizations where they could set their own priorities and not always be f- made to feel like second-class citizens, even within activist circles. Mm-hmm. Or like a perk, like, oh, women get the right to vote, and that's like the cherry on top, I guess, will, you know give some to black women or whatever or just like Like a a side note she's working so hard she's so brilliant she's never going to be given a leadership position in these like women's suffragette movements because Mm -hmm. there are all these white women clogging the fucking leadership boards Mm -hmm. so in 1866 she delivered a speech at the national women's rights convention in new york city titled we are all bound up together in which she stated, quote, we are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity and society cannot trample on the weakest and feeblest of its members without receiving the curse in its own soul. You tried that in the case of the Negro. You white women speak here of rights. I speak of wrongs. I, as a colored woman, have had in this country an education which has made me feel as if I were in the situation of Ishmael. My, which I don't really understand. My hand against every man and every man's hand against me. While there exists this brutal element in society which tramples upon the feeble and treads down the weak, I tell you that if there is any class of people who need to be lifted out of their airy nothings and selfishness, it is the white women of America. Oh. Still true. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So after this speech... Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um... (laughs) I'm the, sure that turned off some of the white I think women there was in the some room. <laughs> fan waving. Mm-hmm. Uh, pearl clutching. <laughs> pearl clutching. Pearl clutching. <laughs> Mo in my hoop skirt. Mm, I have to get some air. <laughs> I'm gonna write about this in my needlepoint. Yes. <laughs> I hope someone's taking minutes. Where do I leave a Yelp review? Oh, Lord. <laughs> I want to speak to your the manager. manager. <laughs> so they did agree to form uh, the American Equal Rights Association, which specifically incorporated African-American suffrage into the women's suffrage movement. But this organization was really short lived and it dissolved shortly after Congress proposed the 15th Amendment. Divide and conquer. Mm hmm. So some of the suffragists in the AERA, most prominently Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, did not support the 15th Amendment. We already went into this. I'm not going to go into all of it. Francis, on the other hand, did not want to undermine the progress of black men by pitting women's suffrage against black suffrage. So she was kind of like, look, it doesn't it doesn't have to be one or the other. But if they're handing out rights, mm-hmm. take mm-hmm. take what you can now as long as you fucking help us later. Right. Mm-hmm. So as a result, this group divided into two separate groups, the National Woman Suffrage Association, which did not support the amendment, and the American Woman Suffrage Association, which did. So 
Scholars of this time period have proposed that it was this suffrage split that alienated Francis Watkins Harper and other black activists from the women's suffrage movement. Indeed, despite her dedication to and prolonged involvement with the movement, Frances Watkins Harper's name is rarely mentioned in connection with women's suffrage today, and I had never heard of her. Mm-hmm. And like, I had never heard her name until I started research for this episode, which right. is a yeah. tragedy. Yeah. So after this split, uh, Frances spent the rest of her life working in the pursuit of equal rights, job opportunities, and education for black women. She was the co-founder and vice president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs and the director of the American Association of Colored Youth. How did she find the time? I know, I'm like... I barely have the energy to talk about her I accomplishments. Have, I have no resume <laughs> in her resume. That is, how, that is how lazy I am. I'm just like, oh, I'm exhausted. Her resume could fit on like a scroll the length of Pennsylvania mm-hmm. Avenue and yeah. I have... No, re- my resume and could she's fit on. She's a mother. My resume could fit on this. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, is that a mini post-it? Yeah, it's a mini post-it <laughs> for those who are not yet on. I Patreon. thought you just had huge hands. No, nope. <laughs> I'm a giant test. It can fit on this. This. <laughs> this is my bed. Here's my purple mattress. All oh, cute. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> um. Okay, also some temperance stuff, but again, we're just going to overlook that because it didn't age well. So she... Um, <laughs> not she, in this circle. <laughs> no, not in this house. Not in this coven. <laughs> so, not in my house. <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> she, li- she lived a really long life, especially for the time period. She died of heart failure on February 22nd, 1911 at the age of 85. Wow. Uh, and she was buried in Eden Who Cemetery. Who the time? Seriously. <laughs> in her least favorite state, Pennsylvania. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. I know. Egg <laughs> Zoom, Francis. They're so mean. Yeah, p- move the poor gal. <laughs> Egg Zoom, Francis. <laughs> Let's start a petition. Uh, yeah. uh, um, uh, she uh, was buried next to her daughter, who actually died before she did, which is very oh, sad. All right, fine. Uh, so exhume Mary too, I guess. <laughs> On the occasion of the 2019 Smithsonian exhibit that re-examined the suffrage movement through a broader intersectional lens, historian Martha S. Jones said of her, quote, the arc of her life is remarkable, but in her many embodiments, she tells us a story that women's lives aren't only one thing. Mm-hmm. And she tells us that the purpose of women's rights is to raise up all of humanity, men and women. Like that is what feminism is. She persists in advocating for a set of values that reflect the principles of human rights today. And there is a memorial statue that was erected in 2020 to her in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The only good kind of erection. (laughs) (laughs) Let me tell you. I mean. That's my takeaway from this Mm -hmm. brilliant, beautiful woman's life. Mm -hmm. Better (laughs) than perks up at erection. There it is. It's better than just a dick. My God, can you imagine just a dick? I mean, actually, I do have that in my bedside table, and it's pretty great. But the yeah. fact that anyone no, could erect. look at a flaccid penis and think that that was somehow superior, <laughs> like, like, fine, okay, it, they exist, like, great. I'm not like disparaging <laughs> anyone who has a penis, but like, <laughs> but if you're gonna look at one. It's better if it's erect, right? Oh, my God. Oh, it's just, who, oh, not into it. Not into the flaccid. A little (laughs) soft. It's like when you pull off a, pull off your no-show at the end of a long day. (laughs) It's like all kind of I also hate that. Smells and sights. Well, who's going to use that? It's not good. (laughs) Ugh. Well, I sure hope you liked that clip. If you did like that clip, make sure you are subscribing to our YouTube channel, leaving us a nice review, and joining us on Patreon for even more video content, audio content, salacious content all around. Come join us. Treat yourself.